Welcome back! After the Cannon Keys Practice 65, it's time to up our soldering game. So today we'll be building the Gingham, a true hole only bare PCB kit, which means nothing has been soldered on the board yet. So get ready for a great deal of soldering ahead. Hopefully by the time we finish this kit, we should be content in handling a soldering iron. So let's get started. When you buy the kit, it already comes with a carrying case. So let's see what's inside. We get a thank you note and a sticker. A bunch of signal diodes. More components. Uh, we will list them down one by one later. We have bolts and nuts. These are the microcontroller port expander and their respective sockets. The plexiglass top cover. A screwdriver. The main PCB without any components on it. And finally, the bottom PCB or bottom plate. Next are the list of tools and parts we will be needing to complete the build. A soldering iron. The solder, I recommend you use a 0.6 diameter 6040 rosin core solder wire cutter, soldering iron tip cleaning sponge, some eye protection but in my case I'm using a headband magnifier, tweezers, soldering flux, solder sucker, soldering wick, and finally music to keep you relaxed and calm while building your board. I would also recommend a silicon pad to protect your desk pad from the solder. Before we start, I change the order of how the components are soldered on the board. It's usually best practice to start with the smallest components first and work your way up in terms of component size, which is what's on the official build guide for this kit. But for beginners, it's best to start with components that are less affected by heat buildup. So for this build, we start with switches, IC sockets, and connectors first, then followed by resistors, capacitors, and diodes, and finally we attach the ICs or the chips which are ESD sensitive. And with that said, let's begin the build! Set soldering iron between 320 to 350 degrees Celsius. Let's start with the two push button switches. These go into SW68 and 69 on the PCB and don't have a specific orientation. It's best practice to always have a clean tip when soldering. For beginners, the soldering sequence goes soldering iron in. Make sure it touches both the component lead and the PCB pad at the same time. Wait a few seconds, apply solder, solder out, and soldering iron out. What we are aiming for is a conical shaped solder joint. Let's do the IC sockets next. Let's start with the smaller one that goes into position U2. Make sure you align the socket notch to how it's printed on the PCB. With sockets, I solder the corner first before proceeding with the rest of the leads. bigger socket goes into position U1, align the socket to the PCB printing, and of course, we solder the corners first. Just a reminder, soldering iron in, apply solder, solder out, soldering iron out. 
Next is the Crystal Oscillator, which goes into position Y1 on the PCB. It does not have a specific orientation, but I like to align the component's label to the PCB silkscreen print orientation. To keep the component from sliding out or moving during soldering, bend the leads to around 45 degrees and try to have the bend as close as possible to the PCB hole. We then proceed with soldering. Next, we trim off the excess leads. Try to cut as close as possible to the solder joint. The fuse goes next, it goes into position F1. It does not have a specific orientation. Just like the crystal oscillator, we bend the leads 45 degrees, solder and trim off the excess leads. We then install the female USB-C connector. Most consider this to be the hardest component to solder as the lid pins are almost microscopic. But there is a specific technique to solder components like these. It's called drag soldering. And the key to drag soldering is to use gobs of flux. As mentioned, apply a generous amount of flux. Then drag a bead of solder across the pads or pins. We now proceed to install the 10 kilo ohm resistors. You can Google how to read resistor color codes to help you identify which resistor is which. These do not have a specific orientation on the board, but I like to align the color band sequence to the PCB's silkscreen label orientation. I forgot that you have to bend the resistor leads manually. There are many ways to bend them, but in my case, I just use my fingers. As usual, bend the leads 45 degrees, solder and trim the excess leads. Just repeat the previous sequence for all the other resistors. Same procedure here, insert into PCB hole, bend leads 45 degrees, solder, trim excess leads, and repeat. Now move to the capacitors. Hopefully at this point, you should already be a bit comfortable soldering components on the board. So we'll insert all the components at once and do the soldering in one go. Just a bit of caution, these ceramic capacitors are a bit fragile and can crack. So be careful not to over pull the leads through the PCB. Again, you can just Google how to read capacitor markings to help you identify the component. Electrolytic capacitors are polarized, 
which means they have a specific orientation or direction when installed on the PCB. In this case, the negative lead goes on top. To determine the negative lead, it's marked by a stripe on the capacitor, and it's also usually the shorter lead on the component. Now that we have inserted all the capacitors and have bent the leads to 45 degrees, it's time to solder all of them in one go. Again, just a reminder, soldering iron in, apply solder, solder out. Okay, the same. Soldering iron in, apply solder, solder out, soldering iron out. We are almost done with the components. It's time to solder the diodes. These components are usually polarized, so they need to be installed with a specific orientation on the PCB. Let's start with the LEDs. As mentioned earlier, the shorter lead is the negative, which means the longer one is the positive one. Orient the component based on the PCB label. The longer lead inserts into the hole labeled positive. Also notice the different pad shape. For polarized component, the negative pad is usually square. As mentioned earlier, diodes are polarized. They have a black line to indicate the negative lead. Looking at the PCB position D15 and D16, the square pads are at the bottom. So the black line needs to be oriented towards the bottom of the PCB. Same as the Zener diodes earlier, the signal diodes have a black line to indicate the negative lead. Looking at the PCB, the square pads are at the top, so orient the diodes with the black line towards the top of the PCB. By this time, we should have gotten our groove in terms of soldering components. So soldering all these diodes should now be a breeze. Just a reminder, soldering iron in, apply solder, Solder out, soldering iron out. Congratulations for making it this far. That wasn't so hard, right? But we are actually not done yet. We still have lots of soldering ahead. Time to insert the ICs or chips. We installed these last as they are technically the most sensitive component. Don't forget to align the notches on the chip and the socket when installing. Before we proceed to the next phase of the build, it's time to check our board first. I usually start with a little prayer before plugging in. Once plugged in, your computer should be able to detect the board. The kit's microcontroller is also preloaded with VIA, so you can load that up and if everything's correct, VIA should be able to detect your board. VIA also comes with a key tester, 
So switch over to that tab and using tweezers, ground the holes for the switch leads on the PCB. This should register as a key press on VIA. Do this on all the switch holes. If everything checks out, it's time to install the switches. Normally, you just solder the switches directly to the PCB. But in this case, I wanted to convert the board to be hot swappable. To do that, we will be using Milmax sockets. To install these sockets, I usually just slide them through the PCB holes and use tape to hold them in place. You can check out my Canon Keys Practice 65 V2 build. But the Gingham has this oval shaped switch holes, making aligning these sockets a bit difficult. So I had to install the sockets on the switch and then insert the switch on the PCB to ensure proper alignment. Before we solder the sockets, verify if the switches are in the correct position for your desired layout. In my case, I opted to have a split right shift. Same soldering sequence for the Milmax sockets. Soldering iron in, wait a few seconds, apply solder, solder out, and soldering iron out. Be careful not to put too much solder as it could spill into the socket, rendering them useless. After soldering, test if all the switches are working. If everything checks out, you can now pull out all the switches. Before final assembly, it's best practice to clean out excess flux using 99% isorphophil alcohol. After cleaning, it's time for the final assembly, and we start with the stabilizers. I'm currently placing these foam stickers. They are not included in the kit and are actually optional. They dampen the sound of the stabilizers when it hits the PCB. By the way, I've looped the stabilizers off cam. After the stabilizers, we now install the bottom plate. I won't go into detail on how it's done, but basically you just insert a bunch of bolts and secure them with nuts. The kit does not include a switch plate, but since we opted to convert it to hot swap, we need one to hold the switches in place. For this build, I use an FR4 plate that was meant for a tray mounted keyboard like the Tofu. Please check the video description for more plate details. 
final tests before we install the keycaps. That's about it. Hopefully this video inspired you to try and build a true hold keyboard kit yourself. Kits like these might not be the best sounding but they certainly can be tweaked to sound better. They have lots of character and would definitely get noticed first by your friends compared to a more conventional looking keyboard. They'd be even more amazed when you tell them you soldered every component. So what are you waiting for? Kits like these are almost always in stock. Grab one today and have fun building!